And welcome to Austin Live. This is crazy. Every time we come in here, the, it looks different, doesn't it? Um, we're, we're getting there. So uh, we're coming to you live from our studio now. So um, you should still be, and I apologize that I have army dress for tonight. Um, I'm Shannon Conrad, and I'm excited to be here uh, in our new big studio. Doesn't look like our studio. Uh, used to be that our studio looked ginormous, but it wasn't. And now our studio has, uh, it looks ginormous than it is. So uh, I'm excited to be here. We're going to be with you live for the next hour, talking uh, about this, this particular before everybody breaks out into the hive, I think I got you now. I think that um, there are a lot of things to be concerned about when talking about compliance with anyone, right? And, and so we're going to say to you first, always, right? So we are going to be talking about that in just a second. First, we've got to take care of a little bit of business here. Uh, I want to remind all of you that we're live right now and the chat is open. I see that um, Sarah is there and she says the sound is very low and so Craven is on top of that. And get a little bit better quickly and uh, but that's a great way that you can write in and interact with us we want to hear from you your thoughts your feelings about the set about the topic about something that's going you can send in other questions uh, there we go so sound should be better Sarah let us know if the sound uh, she says it's perfect now uh, great and Parker says much better see Traven is so on top of it see Lisa it wasn't you it wasn't you um, it's it should be better now Amanda's here with her blue hearts Amanda I just love looking at your precious babies this morning uh, I love seeing pictures of your kids you guys and because they're all beautiful and Amanda's got some really gorgeous kids okay and Christina we're saying hi to you and Lisa thank you for being on the job this morning with us Okay, so a couple of different things. As I said, we're live right now on Facebook, on YouTube, on Twitter, about a dozen other sites. Traven is going to be showing those to you. And uh, at some point during this opening monologue here, he's going to put that up for you. I also want you to let you know that uh, we're a podcast, if you don't know that already. And we're a free download wherever you get your podcast. Oh, look at, look at where the drone is coming in. Uh, don't look at the pores on my nose. In any case, uh, we're, we're thrilled to be here and to provide you, uh, oh, Lisa, I'm seeing your message. I hope that you guys feel better uh, as soon as possible. Gwarov is saying hi from India. So thrilled that you're here, Gwarov. Uh, so excited. I'd love to know where you guys are watching from because uh, that makes it extra fun for me. I didn't do well in geography and then I'm old enough that geography changed. A lot of countries changed names since I took geography. So I love hearing where you guys are from because I usually will go and look it up on maps afterward. Um, okay, um, uh, Emily, I'm so, I'm so sorry that they're treating you badly in the psychiatry system and I want to know, do you have an advocate, someone who can be with you? This is important for all of us, right? I, I experienced this last night. Last night, I had a scheduled test that has been taking almost a year to happen. And it was a thing where I had to be at the hospital at 8.45 last night. And the last time I went for the test, they couldn't do the test because I'm allergic to what they were giving me. And it said it right on my chart, although I had to point it out to them and say, are you sure that you're supposed to be giving me that? Because I, I am allergic to that. And they were like, no, you're not allergic to that. And I said, yeah, I, can you look at my chart? I think on my chart, it says I'm allergic to that. And then they looked and they were like, oh, good heavens, you are allergic to that. And then I went again last night. Guess what happened last night? Same thing. Um, and I, so it's very important. Can you imagine if I wasn't feeling well enough or, or didn't know the words or have the words to say, um, you know, no, that isn't then. And, and both times the texts were like, I feel terrible because I was giving you something that your chart clearly says you can't have. So we all need advocates. We all need advocacy. Now, sometimes you can advocate for yourself and when you can and you do, fantastic. But there are times when all of us do not feel up to advocating for ourselves or when it gets so tiring that we don't even have the words anymore or perhaps that, you know, there are some places that I feel totally able to advocate for myself and other places where I'm like, I, I need to take a lawyer in with me because I don't know how this works here. So um, tell me if you, but I see that you, where you're writing in from, Emily, tell me if you have an advocate um, because maybe we can look for you in that country and see if advocacy is there. It's got to be. Um, that's a, you know, um, I'm just going to say Sweden is supposed to be an enlightened nation. 
uh, let's see if we can't help you to locate where an advocate would be so that you're not being treated poorly. Um, okay. And um, yes, I hear you saying that you're tired and it's hard to advocate for yourself. Got it. So uh, we're, I'm going to look into that after the show. And my email is shannon at autism-live.com if you want to write directly to me, Emily, so that we can start a conversation offline. And I can contact some people in Sweden and say, hey, you know, we need an advocate for this person. Can't promise, but, you know, I, I feel empowered to, to do that and would be happy to do that for you. Tiffany says, hello from Rhode Island. I love, love, love that. Okay, wonderful. So um, for those of you who maybe this is your first time watching the show, this is, this is sort of the deal when we do Autism Live. A lot of times we have guests on the show, and I love that because we have experts and, and ad, advocates and um, self-advocates and all different kinds of people, family members, who talk about their experience here. During this summer, we've been doing a series called Parent to Parent, while we, you know, it's helped us to sort of contain our studio a little bit so that we can come to you live from the studio, but also because I have a book out that's called Autism Parent to Parent. I am not a person who is diagnosed on the spectrum. I cannot speak to that unique point of view, which is why we showcase it here both on Autism Live and on our show Stories from the Spectrum, which is only content by individuals who are actually autistic or consider themselves neurodiverse, right? The only point of view I can really come from in this field is as a parent, and I identify as a proud pony. I'm a parent of a neurodiverse individual. And so I know a thing or three about that because my son is now 19 years old and was diagnosed with classical autism at the age of two and a half, was considered for all intents and purposes non-verbal at that point, not non-vocal because he could make sounds. Um, and there, there were about three to five words that he could say, but they weren't communicative. Uh, he would say dog, 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 dog for hours, right? And we were told to, you know, let go of hope. And, you know, there was a moment when I think that thought crossed my mind. Uh, but we were lucky that we got good help, good support, good ABA. I hope you watched yesterday's show. I hope you guys are writing in your questions because we're going to answer your questions about ABA next week, live during Ask Dr. Doreen. I just lost one of my clippies here. Um, but um, we got the best help possible, and we leaned into it. That's scary. Uh, <laughs> Traven's working out the bugs here. Uh, but we leaned into it. We did everything that we could. And one of the things that I prayed, I literally prayed on the floor was, help me to help my child, please don't let me be the parent who can't figure this out. If there's something to be figured out, put it in front of me clearly. Help me to see it, because sometimes I'm a little obtuse. And I promise if you help me to help my child, I promise that I will turn around and spread that word and help whoever I can. That is why I'm sitting in this chair today, because that prayer was answered. That prayer was answered more than I could have imagined. So I have a responsibility to all of you and to all of the people that you know to spread good information. And that is what I'm trying to do here. And we're going to talk about compliance, and I think that that is spreading good information. But I'll tell you what else I think is spreading good information is what I'm going to talk about next. We've started featuring this on the show because it is very important to me that you get this information. If you watch our show, you know that this is our mission, right? And that a couple of months ago, we covered a story uh, about a study that was done um, showing that babies who were exposed to acetaminophen during pregnancy have a significantly higher risk of later being diagnosed with autism. I'm reading it off the page because it's important that I get it right, right? Um, and research is ongoing in this field, but we, we've learned a thing or three from, from this, that more research needs to be done, and that because of this study, that now the U.S. Food and Drug Administration has now, is now urging careful consideration before using any pain-relieving products during pregnancy. That's a message that you need to share with yourself and with all of the women that you know in your life because you know if we wait for them to tell us directly how long that will take, right? Um, and, uh, but in the meantime, um, there is this very sharp concern 
concerning acetaminophen, uh, such as and, and anything containing acetaminophen during pregnancy. That includes things like Tylenol or Excedrin. And for those of you who are right now sitting there and going, oh my gosh, uh, hang on a second here. When I was pregnant, I was told to take those kinds of things, that that was the only thing to take for my pain. And now you're sitting there with one or more children that are your children who have now been diagnosed with autism. So I'm gonna read this to you because it's super important, this information that you get it today. If you or a loved one use Tylenol or other medications containing acetaminophen while pregnant and later gave birth to a child diagnosed with autism, you may be entitled to financial compensation. The law firm of Shapiro Legal Group is now evaluating potential claims by parents of autistic children. And I personally urge you to call them. Call Shapiro Legal Group today to see if you qualify, because you may qualify for financial compensation. And please spread this message to your friends in the community who may be unaware. I hope that you guys will, anybody that you know that might, just all you have to do right now, for instance, if you're watching on Facebook, put the name of the person that you want to hear this information in the chat. That will immediately give them, the, all they'll have to do, they'll get a notification, they tagged you, and then they'll be able to watch this back or when this is podcast, share it with people or just take down this number, right, to share with them. Because here's the important thing, there are time deadlines. So you really need to urgently call and see if you're eligible uh, and see if, you know, you, if you can file a claim. So here's what you do. You reach uh, Shapiro Legal Group at 888-657-0455. Again, that number is 888-657-0455. You can also contact Shapiro Legal Group by going to their website and filling out the form at shapirolegalgroup.com forward slash autism. I personally have talked to these folks and I urge you to call them. Uh, okay, and here's what you need to know about them, and I'm supposed to read this at, a, at a, like a fast pace, like, you know, one of those people. I'm not so good at it, so let's see how fast I can go. Shapiro Legal Group, PLLC, uh, associates with attorneys throughout the country to help people nationwide and is licensed in New York and Washington, D.C., and has its principal office at 60 East 42nd Street, New York, New York. This ad was read by a non-attorney spokesperson. That would be me. I am the non-attorney spokesperson. So, and here, if you're watching us in podcast, is more inf important information to know about that. But I am telling you that I personally have talked to the folks at Shapiro Legal Group, and, um, and that is why I am talking about it here on the air. Um, and Amanda has said here, it is also very important not to give acetaminophen to our kids while sick. They have studies that show it opens up. It opens up the blood-brain barrier. That means the worst thing that you can do is to give your sick kids possibly allowing inflammation and bacteria straight to the brain. And um, Amanda, I so appreciate you saying that. I think if you guys do any amount of research on this, you will see that they, um, they have stopped recommending that, especially for babies, um, giving acetaminophen to babies when they have a fever. I will tell you that there are times and places, you should be talking to your physician about this, right? There are times and places where they weigh it, and if they're not able to give other things that, you know, preventing a high fever, sometimes the doctors will prescribe it. But yes, there is a concern, and we should not willy-nilly be giving acetaminophen to any child who is sick at this time. And again, research is ongoing. But if you are already in this position and you took acetaminophen or, or anything that contained acetaminophen like Tylenol or um, Excedrin, you should be calling Shapiro Legal Group. That's the message from me this morning. Moving on, we're going to be talking about compliance this morning. I'm just um, looking over um, some of the things that, okay, you want the email again? My email, Shannon at autism-live.com. And any of you can use that at any time. Please reach out to me. We're all part of the same tribe, right? That is, um, that you, please use that email. Know that I'm an imperfect person and, and email is an imperfect thing. And if you don't hear back from me, I would say within 48 hours, Send your email again. Be kind. Don't assume that I'm a flake, although you could. Uh, 
<laughs> but sometimes I open an email, like I, I have to be very good about when I'm in the studio not opening an email because I go, oh, that's important. I want to write back to that. And then I come back to doing the show and all memory of opening that email goes right out the window. It's not because I don't care. It's because I'm a little bit of a bubble head. I'm trying. I'm working on it. But, um, you know, write me, and if you don't get an answer, write me again. And then if you still don't get an answer, some of you have said something here, and it's because you're blocked, or I don't know what. Uh, Lori says, on Monday when you did the IEP segment, I took your advice, and as of today, they found a school. Transportation and starting date of class is tomorrow or Friday when they get transportation ready. Oh, girl. Uh, I contacted the teacher about who my son is, and she brought up the IRP meeting, and I will hear about it next week. The terminology I used and, and what and how I worded it was brilliant. It went a long way. Big thanks to you in the show. I have goosies all over me, Lori. That's why we're here. I said earlier, if I don't pay it forward, you know, what was the point, right? Um, and um, I, I, and I, one of you is writing in saying you're having a sense, I don't know whether it's you having a sensory overload or your child had one on Monday. It's hard. It's hard. Uh, it is very hard. Uh, at least it says, pray for wisdom daily. Amen to that. Okay. Uh, oh, hard morning. I see. Not hard Monday. Hard morning. Uh, uh, and, but can you tell us, Christina, is it you or your little? Um, Tiffany says, I'm a Nana to an eight-year-old ASD, ADHD, and need help with disciplining her. You've come to the right show on the right day. I've never said no until lately, and it's very difficult for both of us. Um, okay. All right, let's, um, Tiffany, I, I, I want to say it's important that you talk with your physician about what is okay to give your child, because obviously I'm not a doctor. I'm not even pretending to play one on TV. Um, when your child has a fever, I will tell you um, that there are many other recommendations of things that they can do, but one of the things that we found was, you know, there was a time and a day when these over-the-counter medicines were not there, and there were things that people did. Now, um, it's very important that you be talking to a doctor. And I'm not giving medical advice here, but what we discovered for our son is that when he started to brew a fever before it got to a high fever, that, you know, when I was a little kid, before there were these over-the-counter things, my mother would take a, a cool, not a cold, uh, washcloth and put it on... Uh, different parts of my body to help lower my temperature. And sometimes that's enough to stop the high fever. When your child is having a high fever, though, or moving towards a high fever, you should always be talking to your doctor. Always, 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 always be talking to the doctor. Okay. Um, uh, oh, I love this. Lisa, you're, you're doing a great job. This is exactly uh, what you said you wrote to the teacher about lunchtime. A Amen, girl. You're, you're doing a great job. Okay. Um, and we all are a part of the same tribe. And thank you, Lisa, for posting also my email so that others can get it as well. Okay. But today I want to be talking about compliance because compliance is a super important thing. Um, and and it's, it's a, a double-edged sword, right? Um, and so if you could see on the slide, because the, the, I put it a little bit small, but I, I, I say compliance, but what kind of compliance are we talking about here? Because I don't know about you, when somebody says compliance, the control freak in me goes, wait, wait, what? Right? And if we're going to be teaching a child to be compliant, if you are somebody who comes from a background of any trauma, they're, like you are going to immediately go, whoop, and, and you're going to have some feelings and emotions. Okay. So is that, so that's this one then, right, Trayvon? All right. Thank you. We're switching cameras here. Okay. Don't mind us. So um, fantastic. So let's, and I'm in control of the slides here. Okay. So I want to start to talk about this in a very realistic way. What is it? It's so important that we always go, wait a second. What am I trying to achieve? Where am I trying to go? What do I want to make happen here? So I have a question for all of you. I think I know the answer, but is what you want is a happy child who listens or a compliant child? And, and I think that this is a super important distinction for us to make for ourselves as parents first. What is it that we want? And I put the tiger there with the beady eyes. I love tigers. Tigers have gotten a bad rap because they're now associated with tiger moms. 
And I think it's a very confusing thing about, you know, people have said to me, oh, are you a tiger mom or are you a helicopter mom? And I'm like, how about I'm a mom? Uh, how about I'm a mom who wants my child to be happy and safe? Uh, if, that, if that means you've got to call me a helicopter mom, I can live with that. But I will not be called a tiger mom because that's not what I'm looking for. And tiger moms are moms that are proud of the fact that they're going to discipline their children into doing what they want them to do regardless. And that, you know, when you talk to people who are tiger moms or dads, that to, they'll, to the point where they will take away their children's blankets to get them to comply. That is not what I'm talking about. And because I'm always like, what do the studies show? <laughs> what do the studies show? And what the studies show is that kids who are taught compliance for compliance sake will, and if you think about it, and this is everybody, this is on the spectrum, not on the spectrum, the first opportunity that they get, they will rebel against that and do the exact opposite, even if it is to their detriment. Well, that's not what I'm looking for, and I hope that's not what you're looking for, right? Now, when ABA professionals are talking to us about gaining compliance and compliance training, I want to always assume that they're talking about the one that I'm talking about. But if you watched yesterday, we're, you know, not going to assume anything anymore because there are ABA people out here who don't get it. For whatever reason, don't get it. And we don't want that, I think, that's, I, that's what I'm going to say. I don't want that. You have to tell me, but I, you guys are writing in. You want the, the happy children who listen. Right? And there's lots of reasons why we want happy children. And there's even there's as many reasons why we need them to listen. And I know for some of you, you're still like, I don't know. Well, let's talk about that. But, okay. So um, here we go. So uh, this for, I'm saying for the purposes of this talk that we are saying that a, a happy child who listens but also feels empowered to say no and there's lots of ways to say no, it doesn't have to be vocal, right, is going to equal compliance. That is the kind of compliance that I'm going to be talking about today, and I'm going to talk about why that's super important, because, it, you know, this is where I draw the line in the sand. I want a child who is able to discriminate when should I be compliant with what's happening and when shouldn't I be. If you think about this, this is super duper important for all of us, right? That, you, I don't know about you, but, you know, when you go someplace, like to a concert or something, and there's a line, or Disneyland, or wherever you're going, there's an there's a ice cream place here in Los Angeles that has a line that lines up out in front of it, the salt and straw. And there's no sign saying, here is the line for salt and straw. There's just a line there, right? And so, and you just watch people get in the line. And I'm always the person who has to ask, what is this line for? Am I in the right line? I'm the obnoxious person who often goes into the store and says, I just want to check, is that the line I'm supposed to be standing in? Because I've stood in a line before that was not the line. Do you know what I mean? So I want to be a compliant person. And if there's a line that I need to stand in to get the thing that I want to get, I want to understand that that's what the line is. But I'm going to ask questions. You know why? Because my mom taught me to ask questions. My mom taught me that boundaries are important. I'm still learning it at this ripe age that I am right here. Um, but it's really hard. This is hard, high-level stuff. But a lot of times, people go on one side of this or the other with kids on the autism spectrum. They go, oh, the child is not going to be able to learn to discriminate, so I'm going to take away all choice from them, and I'm going to make the choice from them, and I'm going to say that that is not the smooth move. That is not going to get you to the happy child, right? But then there are people who are on the other side of it, and they're like, why can't people just let people be who they are? And my child is someone who, you know, needs to express themselves by drawing on the walls, and why are you trying to put them into a pigeonhole? Well, because a lot of times, if we don't give them a basis of understanding, then they become people who are victims. People can take advantage of them, either by, you know, not, you know, the person who means well but doesn't lock the door and your child elopes and bad things happen, right? Or somebody who's up to no good. And unfortunately, there are people who are up to no good in the world. 
I, um, I, I, I am shocked, right, um, that when I was teaching, because uh, I, was, I, I was a school teacher teaching regular public school when my child was born. And while I was on maternity leave here in Los Angeles, there were two cases that were sh so shocking, I'm not even going to tell you how horrible, right, of things that teachers did with their kids in the classroom. That I remember walking around for days just going, I don't, I don't, I don't even understand. I don't even understand how a person could be that evil. I don't get it, but we all have to acknowledge that there are bad people in the world up to no good. And it's important that we protect our children from them as best we can, as best we can. And part of that is giving them a skill set where they have boundaries, where they understand that it is okay to say no. But we also have to teach them that there are certain rules that we want to adhere to because that also keeps you safe. Now, it just so happens that by teaching them these things, we set up a circumstance in which our children are happier. We know that children like a certain amount of boundary and they like to feel safe. And they are happier when they know what the rules are and know how to get the things that they want in life. So that's the space that I'm coming from. Um, well, it, and Lisa says, who doesn't, who doesn't get this? There are people. We're going to go in depth here, okay? There are people who take this a little too far. So what's the roadmap, the beginning roadmap for how do we teach compliance? We have to give clear instructions. We have to make sure that it's 100% clear what it is that we expect of them. We need to give an immediate reward when we're talking about teaching compliance, and we have to give tons of praise. And in the beginning, our, the person that we're working with, by the way, this is for the 48-year-old in your life who's not on the spectrum as well. This works for everybody on the spectrum, three, not on the spectrum, 103, and everything in between right? Clear instructions that, that are meaningful to them and that they can understand, which that in and of itself, you know, is a thing, right? Immediate reward that's meaningful and tons of praise. In the beginning, the person may not react to praise it, because for them, praise may not do it. But we're going to constantly pair that immediate reward with praise and eventually praise is enough. Yes, even for our kids. Um, okay. And, and yes, we are always learning. So um, this is the roadmap. We're going to keep coming back to this. Clear instructions. So I know what the expectations are. If you go to work and you, or how about go to school today, and you don't know what it takes to get an A, so many studies have been done showing if you don't know what it takes to get an A and you've never been praised for an A, you're not going to work for an A. Why would you work for an A? You don't even know what it feels like to get an A. But we have to first tell you how you can get an A, then we got to help you to get to the A. We have to give you a reward for it and heap the praise on so that you go, hey, this A thing, turns out I kind of like it. I wonder if it'll do it again. And then you do it again. Um, that's why all of a sudden now teachers have rubrics for everything because they have to be able to demonstrate how you can get an A. I, I know. I'm going to get into education things and make everybody crazy. But that's for another topic another time. Um, Oh, and Amanda says, if you say the word compliance in an autism group, uh, there's, a, there's a firestorm. Because again, people, that's why I said, let's define what compliance is. We're talking about a happy child who has the, is empowered to say no. That's what's equaling compliance. If I were you, I wouldn't use the word compliance online. Um, and, and, but now talk to your ABA providers about what do you mean when you say compliance? And watch what they do to see if they're going to follow the instructions we're going to go through here. And I have to give the disclaimer that I am not uh, a BCBA. I'm not a board certified behavior analyst. This talk is not coming from the point of view of a professional expert. This is parent to parent. That my advice of what I've learned over the years um, to tell you to be on the lookout for. Just have to give that little disclaimer. So first of all, what are we teaching? It's important, you know, what are we teaching and why are we teaching and why are we trying to gain this compliance of the happy child who can say no in the right context? Um, well, we want that for safety so that the child, listen, if, if I need for the child, we've all, well, if you haven't by now, I'm going to tell you, in your lifetime, you're going to be in a circumstance 
where you're going to need to say to your child, I need for you to do X. Stand by me, don't step here, don't do this, whatever, and it's life and death, right? And in that moment, you're going to need for your child to be able to trust you and understand that they need to be able to do that. And we're going to talk later about some of the horrible stories of what happens when we don't really, and for some kids, this is an easier lesson, and for some kids, it's going to be an ongoing thing. It's still important, still very important. What we're trying to teach the child in being their partner in teaching and compliance is we're trying to instill in them first and foremost the idea that I will listen to you and I will respond consistently. So we have to not be erratic with this. And we have to be listening souls. If we're going to work on compliance with another human being, we cannot enter into this contract without first knowing that it is for their benefit and that we are only going to use it for their benefit and that we are going to make sure that we are building that trust and building that starts with saying, I'm going to listen to you. I see a lot of times this is the first rule that gets broken. It's easy to break. I'm not saying that these are bad people. As parents, we've probably all done this, right? Um, I, I'm going to say that somebody that I love in this world, recently I was with them, and I did not understand that there was a fear of escalators. And I just was walking and talking and, you know, walked onto an escalator with this person who had a reaction to the fact that we were on the escalator. And I was so busy in my own little world that I wasn't picking it up. And then that person was able to communicate with me after we got off the escalator and say, that's not okay. I was trying to get a word in edgewise. Imagine, I'm hard to get a word in edgewise around. And they said, I, but I need you to understand that I really have a hard time with escalators. So the very next time, like two days later, we were faced with an escalator situation and I was able to have the conversation and say, we have a choice here. We can walk way far out of the way or we can do this escalator. How do you feel? I'll be right with you. We'll, you know, we'll do this, we'll do that. And eventually they agreed. I didn't force them to do it. They agreed to get on the escalator. We have to listen. And I know that there are people who are like, well, they just need to be on the escalator more. That's called flooding. We don't do that with people without their permission. And you can't get permission from somebody who's under 18 because they can't enter into a contract. So we don't do that. that. We just don't do that. And if you're working with an ABA provider who wants to do that kind of thing, flooding, ask them to back up and say, hold up here. No, <laughs> we have not signed off on that. Um, because that's traumatizing. And, you know, you really got to be, there are people who can do flooding and do it well and can make that happen. They're very specific experts who are trained in that. And the person that's doing it has to be in agreement. So we just don't do that. So we've got to listen to our kids. If there's something that you're taking your child to do and you're saying, we're going to do this, and the child is freaking out, stop for a second and listen to them. The child might be afraid of heights. I've told the story here before that my son would have a meltdown in the grocery store, always in the same space, and I couldn't figure out what it was, and it was because the grocery store went into a tiled grid right there, and he did not know how to communicate to me, I'm afraid I'm going to fall through those tiles. So he would throw the mother of all meltdowns right there. Now, I was trying to listen, I just didn't know, and it took help. I had to have outside people on my ABA team had to come with me and they went, oh, this is what's happening because I couldn't see it. But I was listening enough to go, something's happening here, right? He was communicating and people communicated in, in different ways and we have to listen to them and we have to build the trust so that once I knew that, we were able to put a plan in place so that every time we would come to that floor, I would take a second and I would, you know, we were going to walk on that floor, but we worked through a thing that worked for him and now my son runs across tile. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't have a problem with it, but we've got to be in a partnership to work on compliance and it has to come from a base of safety, trust, and saying, I will listen to you and I'm gonna respond consistently. And I'm not just suddenly going to decide to change the rules on you. That's not fair in compliance, okay? Uh, I feel like I beat that to death a little bit. Okay, so, and, and when we're doing this with children, A number one, it has to be that we are safeguarding the child and the child's rights. And if we aren't, 
not only do we need to back that bus up, but we gotta stop. We just gotta stop everything if we feel. And Traven, can you go ahead and um, full screen that? Because I'm gonna need to see it too. It's too small for even me. Okay, so here we go. We never ask a child to do something that traumatizes them. It's rule number one. And if your ABA provider is asking to do something that traumatizes your child, that we already know traumatizes your child, ask them to explain to you fully why they're asking to do what they're doing. And I would say, hey, there's got to be a kinder, gentler way to do this. Um, now, there are things that your child is going to consider traumatizing that you're going to have to work through. Like, you know, it might be traumatizing for your child to have blood taken, but you're there at the hospital and the blood has to be taken, right? I'm not saying we don't treat them, right? But you've got to listen and you've got to build that trust so that when you come, hopefully you've built enough trust so that when you come to that circumstance, when I said to the person in my life, when we were standing at the top of the escalator, I am listening to you, I hear you. What do you want to do? And I will do this, this, and this. Or we can walk all the way around. There's always another way to do things. You know what I'm saying? Sometimes we just got to slow the roll and take the time to do it. But we don't just automatically go, we're never going to teach you how to do that. Um, that. I think that's also unkind too, because what if there's something going on and the person has to use an escalator? Right? Don't we want them to be able to use the escalator? So we're, it's fine in that happy medium, right? But we don't ask them to do something that traumatizes them without being mindful and working through it with them. We never force a child to do something that they're afraid of. We reward them for communicating a no. People are very confused about this. I thought, you know, we, we, we didn't want to give them a choice out. No. We always want to give them choices. And when we have to teach them things that are appropriate and not appropriate. You can't expect a four-year-old, any four-year-old, to know that it's not appropriate for people to, that they don't know, for instance, to be touching their butt. Four-year-olds don't come out knowing that. You have to teach that. And there are kind ways of teaching that to a child, uh, which we can go over. But then we have to reward them for, you know, so if, you're, if you've gone to see Aunt Beth, and Aunt Beth is a big hugger, and Aunt Beth says, come here and give me a hug, and the child says, no, I don't want to, you need to not stand there and give a lecture about, that's Aunt Beth, and you have to give her a hug. Instead, you need to say to that child, oh my gosh, what a big girl, what a big boy, thank you for, you know, good job. You don't, and then you have to say to Aunt Beth, I'm so sorry, we're working on something else right now, and maybe some other time he will give you a hug of his own choice. And Aunt Beth is going to be ticked. Aunt Beth is going to think that you think she's a pariah. Let her. Let her work through that on her own. This is important stuff. And if you want to safeguard your child from not being a victim from these horrible people that are out there who will prey on them, we have to teach them how to say no in appropriate circumstances. And who touches me, rule number one. It used to be that we would put bathing suits on kids and we would have them in their bathing suits and we would you know, stand there and say, um, is it okay if somebody touches you on your shoulder? And, and the, the, the rule was your bathing, your bathing suit is off limits. Nobody gets to touch you where your bathing suit is without you know, your permission, and you have to build it right because sometimes the doctor has to touch them there, right? Um, but the, the doctor should be taught, is it okay if I, you know, what I mean? It's this hard stuff. It's, there's a lot of gray area here, right? But that's how we used to teach it, and then people pointed out that predators start by touching them on the shoulder and saying, oh, that's okay, and then they work up to. So now what we teach them is that they are, that this is your skin, this is your body. Is somebody allowed to touch your hair without you saying it's okay? And this is hard because sometimes you have a teacher who likes to ruffle hair and then you have to say, they don't like that. Or the child says, please don't do that, I, I, I don't like that. Or the child just holds up a, a finger and says no, or punches no, or holds up no. We have to reward that, you guys. We have to, have to, have to reward that. Um, okay, we, it's important that we teach children about levels of friendship and trust, that there are some people that we trust more than others. And like, you know, that's a stranger. I'll tell you who made the difference for me on this was Rosie O'Donnell. Uh, love me some Rosie. She's a member of our tribe. And Rosie was talking about her son. 
and saying that she had taught him stranger danger, stranger danger, you know, don't talk to strangers. But then they would go in her building and there was a doorman at her building and he would talk to her son and her, and she would say, talk to him. And somebody said to her, Rosie, you just told him don't talk to strangers. That doorman is a stranger. How does a four-year-old know what a stranger is and what isn't a stranger? Boy, the light bulb went off in my head when she said that. And it's important that we language all of the relationships with people to our kids as often as possible and that we model the behavior. That we teach them, this is the doorman, and the doorman we talk to. The doorman is not a stranger. But we also, for instance, will teach them, but does that mean that you get in the car and go someplace with the doorman? No. And that we work through those things with kids. Now, you might be saying to me, my child doesn't understand enough about that. You start wherever the child is. Um, and and you, don't, you don't send a mixed message to them. So if, if your child is, it does not, is not yet at that point where they, you can talk about le levels of friendship, you just demonstrate it. They did this so brilliantly with my child. What they did was they started, we had to go around and take pictures of all of the workers and all of the stores that we went to and um, what they wore, like what's the uniform in Target. And they would show him on a board. This is before he had the ability to fully comprehend you guys. And they showed him on a board and they were like, you know, here's your family and your, in your family, here are the rules that you can do this, this, and this with your family. Here are your friends, and here and there were pictures of the friends, right? And then here are workers, and here are first responders, and you know. And so they began to show him visually, and as he began to understand, uh, you know, he would notice when we were in a place. Oh, I know that the workers at Target wear tan pants and red shirt. That means that they're a worker. So we built to if you're lost in a store, who do you ask for help? You can ask a worker for help. Right, and it and it was this lesson that built and built and built. We didn't start with you know the whole thing, um, so it's so important. Tiffany says we had a problem with our neighbor, so now he is called the bad man, and they know not to go near or talk to him. And the police are aware also. Oh, Tiffany, I'm so sorry, um, but yes, it is important. And people go, oh, that's not okay. Don't. Yeah, no, you know, in this world, it's totally okay and necessary. Um, that we label people that we have concerns about for our children and let them know, listen to your gut on this because, um, but again, we teach them that, but we're also teaching them how great it is when you do things by the people in that top tier, in your family, your mom and your dad, or your teacher, you know, if the teacher asks you, for instance, to get in line, that's the good kind of compliance because getting in the line, and we teach that by rewarding them for getting in the line. But we also teach them that, you know, there are a bunch of things that are appropriate and a bunch of things that aren't appropriate. I talked about appropriate the other day. I say that word a lot. And I said that to my three-year-old. That is what I said to my three-year-old. Because I didn't want to say, oh, no, that's bad or that's wrong or that's, you know. And we never said to him that he was a bad boy. Never. We said, oh, you're such a good boy. You're such a good little man. We said all that. We never said you're a bad boy. We said that behavior is not appropriate. And I would say that. I, I would go, what just happened? And I would go, that behavior, not appropriate. He learned appropriate before he learned anything else. He didn't even know what it meant, but he, if mom said that's not appropriate, he knew what that meant before anything else. So um, anyway, I, you guys are writing in, and I love, and I'm saying hello to everybody. Hello to Susie. Um, uh, okay. Uh, I, I'm seeing a bunch of things that you guys have, have written in. Okay. So let's move on here. We have to, Okay. One of the first things that they do with kids that are on the spectrum when they start to do compliance training is they teach, come here. Okay, so first of all, we should be asking the question. Anytime somebody's putting a program in with their child to teach them something, we should always ask why. Why do you need him to come here or her, right? Um, and then I always want to be in the headset of the child because if I'm the child and I'm playing and somebody says, come here, I want to know what's in it for me. Why would I do that? Uh, I like what I'm doing more than whatever you have going on. Why would I want to come over and do that? And I don't even know why you're calling me over there. I don't know what's going to happen when I get there. Um, so why would I take a question mark over the toy that I'm playing with right now? Doesn't seem like a smart choice to me, right? 
And, and the last one is, why do I need to be on your schedule, on your time? I'm playing with a toy. I have no idea what you have going on over there, but I don't want to come, right? And I think that's how any of us would feel if somebody said, come here, right? So it's, there's nothing in it for them. So kids don't want to come. And we see that kids on the spectrum often don't, that the parent says, come here, and they just don't. And then we, you know, then it's, oh, well, the child is not compliant. Oh, the child is disrespectful. In a classroom, that's what you're going to get. Somebody's going to go, oh, they don't listen. They don't respond. They're disrespectful, which isn't the truth. It's not disrespectful to ask these questions. It's not disrespectful to think these things. What's in it for me? Why do I have to be on your time schedule, right? So this is where the respect comes in. So then you might ask, your, ask yourself the question, then why do we start with come here? Why is that the thing that we start with? Well, part of it is that it's easy, that we can teach the child very quickly. There's a good reason to come and good things will happen. And I'm going to build that trust with you to do that. The other thing is that this is the first step towards safety. That if I need to say to a child, come here and have the child come here, I want for my child, for there to be enough trust between us so that he will. If, you know, if, if he is standing on the ledge of a, a busy highway, and it happens, y'all, um, when we, you know, we want to teach a child, stop and come here. <sighs> so it might come down to life or death, literally, and it does in our community. And it is a base upon which we build, because if I, because come here, I can very easily help the child to be compliant with that. So for the first time, I might be working with a team of two of us with the child who is across the room and the person who is starting the lesson, it could be mom, it could be the therapist, it could be dad, but there's another person who's with the child doing an activity, right? Because what we always want to do with compliance is get them to the reward as fast as we possibly can because that's how we teach it, right? So you're, let's say that you're the mom and you're across the room with the child and you're playing and dad is in the other room and dad says, Joey, come here, right? And so what we do as the person that's there is we go, let's go, let's go see what dad wants. We give them incentive to go, to comply. Now they go to dad and when they get to dad, something wonderful happens. What happens? Back to the roadmap, right? was clear instruction. We didn't say, hey, Joey, could you come here for a second? I have something I want to show you. No. We said, Joey, come here. That's it. That's it. It's clear. Come here. I'm telling you what it is that I want. Don't add extra words, right? <laughs> then we give an immediate reward. So Joey comes and whatever is meaningful to Joey, if Joey loves it when dad picks him up, dad picks him up. If Joey loves it when dad hugs him, dad hugs him. Right? If Joey loves it when his hair is ruffled, dad does that. If Joey, all Joey will respond to is candy, as much as I hate it, we take a little itty bitty, you know, piece of candy. And I know people go, oh, it's the dog training thing. It's just the beginning. We do whatever we have to in this moment to get it so that Joey knows when I come there, it's for a reason, good things happen, it's consistent, and it is good for me. But we pair immediately and go, thank you for what, you listen, good job. And I know it feels weird to say good job. And that it's like, you know, who does this in real life? We do it all the time, we just don't vocalize it. We pat people on the back, we give them a thumbs up, we give them a bonus, right? We say good job all the time if we're in a good relationship with people. It's just that we need to make it verbal with our kids. Good job. And you know what you'll find is that you want to say it to all kinds of people. It feels good to say good job once you get over the, oh, this feels awkward. It does in the beginning, right? So we build this base that when you come when dad calls you and you come, it's only ever going to be good. And you will always be rewarded for coming. And, you know, and you're always going to be praised. Now, eventually, we're going to fade whatever the reward was and we're going to have praise be there, right? Or we're going to make the thing smaller until we get praise there. But I'm telling you, it works. It works. And the child is happier because they go, I know what to expect. I know when you call me, it's part of this loving relationship that we have going on. And they want to do it. 
And that's what we want, is a child who wants to listen and come to us. We must never trade on that. We must never say to them, come here and then berate them or punish them. Or, you know, this is, this, you want to talk about dog training. Um, I remember taking my dog to the dog trainer and the, the guy who was next to me, <laughs> like they all, they all asked us to call our dogs to us. And, the, and the, some people, their dog came, other dogs sat there, whatever. And there was the one guy with a German shepherd. And when his dog finally came over, he was like, what's wrong? You know, and he yelled at the dog. And the dog trainer came over and said, you know what just happened? That dog is never going to want to come to you. We're going to have to do so much training now to circumvent what you just did. What, do, if somebody calls you over and the person yells at you, what are you going to do in the future, right? So we want to, when we say come here, oh my gosh, all the praise, immediate reward, and it's always for, you know, for good. Um, we don't do things just for nothing, right? There's a reason why you called them over but it could be just to, um, to hug. So again, the reward has to be meaningful, it has to be safe, it has to be consistent, and the reward has to be bigger than what they're leaving. Now on the one side of the screen, I, I'm showing the mom hugging and kissing the baby. And we can do this early on with babies, that when they're walking, we can say, come here, and then they get there and we hug and we kiss them, but some of our kids don't like to be hugged and kissed. Some of them, not all of them, some of them really, really respond to it and like the squeeze of it, others, it's. Like, you know, my son would like the hug and the squeeze, but I would go, yay, and be loud. And he never, to this day, he's like, oh, mom, you're so loud, right? And so I had to learn how to go, yay, you did it, you're so awesome, which is not me, but that's what was meaningful to my kiddo. But I put the straws on the other side because sometimes we have to offer something that's different than the hugs for the kids who don't like the hugs. So it's not one size fits all. The reward has to be meaningful to them. It has to be safe, the space that they've come to. Uh, you have to be consistent. The reward has to be bigger than what they left. So if they are playing with their very favorite toy and you ask them to come over, the amount of reward and the amount of praise has to be bigger than the enjoyment of playing with that toy, right? It just has to. It's the only way the equation works. It makes sense when you think about it. Okay, so what's the secret to getting started? Um, that, you know, and you can do it, what I just said about um, that one person says, oh, let's go, and makes it exciting, which is, you know, an extra prompt. You can do it that way. But if you have kids that are older and you're like, well, we didn't do that when they were younger, and I don't know how to start this now, Shannon. I don't know how to get this train on the tracks, because what you're trying to do is set up this over and over response that mom says, you know, pick up your toys, and the child picks up the toys, and they get a massive reward and praise for it, right? When you can get on that train where those three things happen on a regular basis, you build trust, the child is happy, they know what to expect, and they listen. That is what happens. So much research on this, but so many of us have lived this, and it's like, wah, cue the angels, right? But how do you get the train on the tracks if the kids don't know? So you can start today, you can start right now, with anybody in your life and play with this. It's your new toy. What you do is if there's somebody who is not being compliant, or let's just say somebody's crabby, and you're like, I need to jolt them out of that, find an excuse to praise them. A lot of times with kids, it starts with asking them to do something that they already wanted to do. Excuse me, what? So if you know that your kiddo likes to change the channel on the remote, because there was the one parent who wrote in to me and said, ah, the child constantly wants to change the channel on the remote, it drives us crazy. Uh, this, is, this is good information. This is something that you know that they already want to do. So if you want to start a compliance cycle with a child, what you do is you go, oh, could you do me a favor? Could you please change the channel on the remote, knowing that it's their favorite thing to do? And then when they do it, you go, good job. Thank you so much for doing it when I asked. And the child will go, what just happened? Who stole my mother? And who put, who, what alien has been put in their place, right? Or if you've been in a thing where you and your child are just button heads, button heads, button heads, find an excuse to praise them for something that they did, even if you didn't ask them to do it. Um, you, you know, so they ate um, their cereal and you say, hey, I really, thank you. Thank you for eating your cereal. You're so good. And they go, what? And a lot of times they're, they're like, what do you, what? I, I don't even know what to do with that. Especially if you've got a teenager, they'll, they'll be like, what, what do you want from me? Right? 
And what you want is a better relationship with them, right? So praise them for something that they did or ask them to do something that you know that they want to do. And I know some of you are like, that's not going to work. Okay. See on the screen, it says, try it. I dare you. I just spilled all down the front of me. How crazy am I? Um, okay. Because, and I put a present on this slide because this is my present to you. This is the biggest secret. If things aren't going well today, all you have to do today is praise someone. It can be a stranger. Um, it changes your mood. It changes, I, I think it changes your DNA. I don't have studies on that. But um, it changes how you perceive what's happening because then they will change, right? And this also works with our kids on the spectrum. So tell them that they're doing a good job. I love, um, there's a gentleman, Hank Moore. He is featured heavily in the book, A Real Boy by Christina Adams, which was my pathway to understanding the beginnings of ABA in the early days. We've had Christina Adams on the show. She's an amazing woman. And she wrote this book about her son's journey through ABA. Now she's got a book out, Camel Crazy, because she's really into camel milk. And we have her on occasionally to talk about that. She's in India right now talking about camel milk. But in her book, uh, A Real Boy, which was about ABA, she would always talk about this Hank that she, you know, he was on her team and he was just amazing. He was just this amazing wealth of knowledge. And if something wasn't going well, she would say, I got to call Hank. And, and Hank would tell her, oh, and he would, and then she would tell us the lesson that Hank would teach. And I would go, this Hank is amazing. And all I wanted was to meet Hank. And, um, and she got her services at CARD, and we went to get our services at CARD. And I remember the first day I was like, where's Hank? Where's Hank? I want to meet Hank. No Hank. And um, it took years before I finally met Hank. And when I did, I cried like a crazy person because I, I was so excited to meet him. And then I got to work with Hank. And Hank is truly an amazing human being on this planet. But the, thing, the hallmark of Hank is that whenever somebody will, you know, like a therapy team will be meeting, they're like, oh, you know, well... How are things going with Billy? Well, you know, Billy's had a rough week and we're just having a hard time and he's struggling and the compliance has been off and, and, and Hank says, oh, okay, we'll up the praise. And I remember the first time I heard him say that, I was like, no, no, they said he's not compliant. And he said, yeah, up the praise. That is the answer when the child is not compliant, up the praise, up the praise, up the praise. And I didn't understand that equation for the longest time, but sometimes you just have to live it. Sometimes you just have to try it. So I'm asking you today, it doesn't have to be with your child on the spectrum, do it with a coworker, do something, praise them for something that they deserve to be praised for. We're not making things up, but everybody's doing something. You can say, hey, I like the way you're breathing. Good job breathing, right? Um, you know, I think make it as meaningful as possible, but everybody needs that praise and you will see, you will change. If you have to praise somebody at Target that, you know, that is a worker, cause you're like, I don't really need, you know, just praise somebody at Target and say, Hey, thank you for doing that and see how the dynamic changes. Try it. It's your new toy. Uh, Amanda says, my son loves praise, always has. He's 14 now. He praises himself now. <gasps> oh, Amanda, you're so good. That is amazing. Um, when I read a book with my granddaughter, I get excited and read loud, and she has asked me not to do that. LOL, Tiffany, I, I feel your pain here. I, I absolutely feel your pain. Um, <laughs> but we learn, you know, it's important to them. Okay, so when people say to me, my child doesn't listen, I say up the praise. Anytime they are doing something good, because that's what Hank told me to do, and Hank is right. Uh, we make the reward more immediate, more meaningful, and more consistent. It might be that the reward, if you put a space between the reward, if you say come here and the child comes and you're on the phone and you're like, yes, 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 and then we go, good job coming, that might not be immediate enough for them. You might have to say to the person on the phone, or, or don't even bother saying anything, to say good job, and then later go, I'm sorry, I had to interrupt for just a second. Put, put your priorities where they need to be, right? Because it has to be immediate. Remember, it has to be meaningful for them and it has to be consistent. In the beginning, you got to do it every time. You're not going to do it every time for the rest of your life. But in the beginning, do it every time until it, it's starting to bleed over into other things, right? Um, have an appreciation for what it is that they're doing, that they're leaving to come and be with you. Think about your life. And if you're engrossed in something, 
uh, and your your head is really there. My husband and I talk about this all the time because when I'm writing, if you interrupt my train of thought, oh my gosh, it's, it takes me so long to get back there, right? And our kids are deep in thought and creativity sometimes. Sometimes they're on their own little planet and we're asking them to step off that planet onto ours for a minute. Don't belittle that. That's not a small thing, right? So give them a second you know, and, and praise them when they do it and have a sense for what they're doing. For many of us, it's the video game thing, right? That, um, and I'm trying to think what the name of the gentleman is who helped me out with this. It's going to come to me. Um, but he said, you know, it used to drive me crazy when my son was a teenager and I would say to him, hey, you know, can you come here? And my son would go, no, I'm playing a video game. I can't come right now. And that he was like, it was disrespect. It was this, it was that. And somebody said to him, Go play the game with your child. Go play the game with your child. And he said he realized, I'm, I've invested 15 minutes and I'm about to storm the castle. And if I leave now, I lost everything that I did. And that sometimes I need to say, I need a minute to finish this round. And that saying, okay, I'm going to give you a minute to finish that round actually builds the compliance too because you're understanding what it is that they're doing, right? If you were in the middle of surgery and your significant other called and said, I need you to call me right now, we would hope that that significant um, other would understand that you can't drop everything to go do that. We need to have that kind of awareness with our kids. Uh, but up the praise, up the praise, up the praise, because that is the thing that in the beginning, you're just pairing it and linking the two together. But down the road, that's the thing that's going to maintain. And look at what Amanda said. Her child is now praising himself. For those of you that are on the opposite side of the equation and having real envy where your child is berating themselves, you, you still have time to change that equation to what Amanda has. But it means you've got to really pay attention to this slide. Up the praise. Anytime they're doing something good, make sure that the rewards you give them are more immediate, more meaningful, more consistent. Be appreciative of what they're doing and up the praise, up the praise, up the praise. Um, Lori says, my son is funny. He praises other people. And when we praise him, he says, uh, no, not to me. I know what I'm doing. LOL. Yes. And there are those of us who get uncomfortable when praised and go, no, 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 no. You don't need to do that for me. Keep praising him. Keep doing it. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about behavioral momentum because used correctly, this is very effective. Used incorrectly, it, it can be horribly, horribly wrong. Um, behavioral momentum is this idea that if I get you to do something, let's say that I, uh, you know, I, I know that you want to change the remote, um, and so I say change the remote, now I've started a chain where you are back, I've praised you for doing it, so we're back in this, we're back on track, we're, we're in this chain of I ask you to do something, you do it, and I praise you for it, right? We know that if I'm going to ask you to do something difficult, that it's easier for you to do it if I've already started behavioral momentum. So if uh, you will see people do something called compliance training with kiddos where it should look like a game where they go, okay, let's play a game. Okay, touch your nose. And the child touches their nose and they go, yes! And they go, okay, now touch your ears. And they touch your ears, yes! Uh, okay, now touch your toes, yes! And then they go, okay, can you pick the red one? Because the picking the red one is hard for them right? But I built the momentum of, okay, you touched your nose, you touched your ear, you touched your shoulder, pick the red one. And they pick the red one and like, yes, right? Um, so whatever the hard one is comes after a string of me asking you to do things that I know for sure you can do, but I had to make it fun. I had to make it fun. I, uh, I, because that is the key to this, right? And it's a vehicle to get me back on track so that you are loving the praise, right? But it cannot be used as a punishment. And in ABA, this is where your, your technicians need to be well-trained because a lot of them don't get this. They just don't. And it's okay for you to school them on this because if you see somebody who is, you know, your child does something and they, you know, they don't give the correct response and, and technicians are taught to say a, a, a flat no, not a no. They're just supposed to say, no, try again. And, and without recriminations, without like shaming anybody, right? So if you're hearing people, there, there's something called a no-no prompt. That if your child gets the wrong answer, let's say that, you know, I put the three things on the table and I say, touch bobblehead. 
right? And they touch this. Then I, then I, could, then I would say, no, try again, right? And it was not like, no, what, how you know what the Bible had? I'm not lecturing. So I'd say, no, try again. And now they touch the keyboard. And, and I would say, no, but now, now I would help them. I would go, let's touch the bobblehead. And I would help, and then I'd go, good, you did it. You touched the bobblehead. And then I would go, you know, touch the bobblehead. And if they do this, you know, no, and, and I touch the bobblehead, right? Uh, try again. And they touch this, no, no, no prompt, right? So I gave you two tries, but I didn't, uh, you know, uh, the no isn't this horrible thing, right? But if we see that we're constantly getting off track with compliance, what they might do is revert back to this compliance training to get the behavior momentum, right? And so they might go, this is too hard right now for whatever reason, and we got to shake it off. So they might go, okay, touch your nose. Right? And so your child touches the nose and they go, yes, that was fantastic. Okay, let's try this one. Are you ready for this? Touch your foot. And they touch their foot. Yes. And then I might go, okay, touch the bobblehead to see. Now, because sometimes they just got to, you know, we got to have that momentum. They got to break the dust off and they want that praise, right? Because it's fun. But what you will see sometimes is that when things get off track, that some greener behavior technicians will go, no, you don't want that try again, you don't want that. <laughs> that. Then we need to give them more direction and tell them, no, that's not the thing, right? And what we especially don't want is anybody using compliance training like touch your nose as a punishment for getting an answer wrong. That is not what it's for. That is not the thing. I'm going to say that again. It is not the thing. If you see somebody using compliance training like touch your nose as a punishment, it is time to say, oh, we need to interrupt this session and, and say, can I speak to you in the hallway? <laughs> and, and then you need to call your supervisor and say, hey, we're not doing this. And then that supervisor will retrain that person. It's a very easy thing to mess up if you don't understand all the things that we just talked about about what are we trying to achieve and why are we trying to achieve it. It's a very easy thing to mess up. You might even mess it up. I certainly have messed it up before. We're not saying that you're an unkind person or that you're not smart. It's easy to mess up, but it's very important that we don't mess up on that, right? Okay, so we never, ever, ever are using compliance training or behavior momentum as a pu punishment. It doesn't work. The whole point of it is to get back on the track of the reward thing. So it would never work if we were doing it as a punishment. And we don't do it to belittle people. That's not what it's for. Okay. Okay, signs that you're doing it correctly. And um, one, that the child is happy. Look at the face on this child. I don't need the child to tell me he's happy. He is loving the smell of that basil, and why wouldn't he? Basil smells wonderful to those of us who like it and horrible to people who don't like it. Um, a child that is, is, is having compliance done in the right way will respond quickly because they want to, because it's good for them and because they trust that good things will happen to them. Uh, they are also a child who knows how to say no. If your child is going through compliance training, I hope that at the same time, concurrent with that, they are teaching your child how to express yes and no. This can be with sign language, this can be vocally, this can be with an icon, this can be by pushing a button, but if they are doing compliance training and your child does not know how to say no, stop that bus rolling and say, I'm willing for you to work on compliance only if we are working on that concurrently with the child being able to say no. And obviously, if they're working on no, they need to work on yes at the same time. And that may take a while, but that doesn't mean that we don't invest the time and invest it early. And remember, you can say yes and no in lots of different ways. This child is saying yes to this basil. And we can, if we are listening and paying attention, we understand that that is a, a yes, right? Um, but we also need to be teaching explicit yes and no while we're doing uh, compliance training. And that, that if, if we're doing it properly, the child begins to show an understanding of boundaries. And that's going to mean that they're, they're beginning to show an understanding of their preferences and being able to communicate them, that this is shaking a head yes, no, pointing, um, manding, requesting things that they want, that's a beginning understanding of boundaries. But also in terms of relationships, which means you don't just hand them over 
to people that they don't know and ask them to give them a hug. Yeah? Um, it's hard. It's hard. This is hard stuff, you guys. Okay. Uh, signs that it's the wrong kind of compliance, that the child is afraid to be wrong. I'm going to pause for a second to say Judge Rottenberg Center, ha, p, t. This is exactly what they do there, and it should be outlawed, and I want to be clear that I am on that side of that argument. They should not be allowed to be in business because what they do is they teach a child to be afraid to be wrong. That is inhumane. It is inappropriate. And if a child shows signs that they are afraid to be wrong, then, then somewhere we have to back that bus up and start over again and teach them that it's okay to be wrong. It's just a bigger party when you are right. And, and if we don't do this, what we have are 14 year olds who are like hitting themselves in the head because they got a question wrong on a quiz, right? And if you're in that boat today, don't panic. You can still change this equation but start on it now, right? It's also the wrong kind of compliance if the child simply doesn't respond. We need to look into that. Is the child hearing the request? Was it clear enough? Did we offer all those things on the roadmap to success? Something isn't right if the child isn't responding at all. It might be that the way we're communicating what we want is not their mode of communication, and then we, it's not the child, it's the mode that we're teaching it, right? Um, the child responds quickly but with anxiety. This is not about having them be anxious. Compliance training should never have them feeling fearful or ang anxious at all. Um, this is exactly the wrong ticket. So all of those things are the wrong thing. Now, I said to you that at some point that I was going to tell, and I'm not going to tell you all the horror stories. We all know horror stories of children that have become victims of, of the bad people, right? I'm not going to go there. But we know that our kids are more prone to that than anybody else. And often, self-advocates will tell us, oh, you, compliance training is terrible. You can't, why, what are you teaching them to be, you're teaching them. I've heard people say to me, oh, ABA just sets up a child to be a victim, and I take big issue with that. I think it's completely the opposite if you're doing this correctly. I, I, I've heard the horror stories of children that this happens to because you know, the child was in a situation where they didn't have boundaries. And it was, and that happens way before whatever the thing happens, right? It's because somebody worked and worked and worked to gain compliance with that child using the techniques in the wrong way, right? We have to be on the other side using the techniques in the right way to teach them to loudly say no if someone is asking them to do something that they know is incorrect or makes them feel funny, right? But there's another side to this too. There's another safety issue. And, um, and this is, oh, I said this is where we cry because, you know, w there's a very famous story of an amazing autism mom who is no longer with us because her house caught on fire. And all, everybody got out of the house except for her son, who w was somebody on the spectrum and pretty severely uh, affected on the spectrum, had a lot of fears. And <clears throat> mom, I'm sorry, it's so hard, right? But mom did, I think, what we all think that we hope we would do. She went back into the burning building to get him and to get him out. And she couldn't. She couldn't get him out. And she died on the stairs with her arms around him and made the choice to be with him because he was too afraid and she couldn't get him to come out of the house. And, and those of us who knew her and knew her work knew that she tried everything that she could to get him out that house. But she couldn't. And part of it is, is that, um, and it's not her fault. It is not her fault. Hear me when I say that. It's not her fault. <clears throat> I blame the system around her for not working harder and teaching her more skills to gain the compliance so that in any situation, even when there are things that are horrible and terrifying, that we can have enough compliance to get our kids to safety. This is everything, right? And if for this mom, if she was not able to, then everybody is at risk. And in her memory, I want to say to all of us, this is important that you start working on this today. But it has to be done right, right? It has to be done right. I'm sorry. And I get so choked up about it. Um, Okay. <coughs> Excuse me, now I'm going to sneeze. 
<coughs> oh, okay. Um, so that's why. That's why we need to be working on compliance. But on the other side, too, we need to make sure that we're not setting them up to be victims. And if we're doing it right, we aren't. But it is incumbent upon us. This is the parent-to-parent -parent talk, right? If we are mindful about what it looks like when it's right, then we will know if people are doing it wrong. I wanted to put that in your backpack today, and I hope that we did. Um, bless you to all of you, too. I'm seeing um, all the hugs and everything that everybody is sending. Um, but, but I know that if that mom were here, uh, and I know that I, I only knew her peripherally, but I, I was very aware of her work and respected and admired her work. Um, but I have so many friends who were close friends for, with her, and um, they are all now trying to gain training for, for exactly this kind of thing. She would want us all to know and, and to find a way so that it didn't have to happen to us. She just would. So in any case, um, compliance, when we're talking about the right kind of compliance, is great. I wouldn't enter into conversations on Facebook with people with the word compliance because, you're, you know, people are going to have a trigger reaction. Let me just say this too. If you are somebody who was traumatized or abused as a child, this is hard. And you feel as a particular, uh, I'm going to speak for myself, I feel a particular concern about making sure that my child is as safe as possible. That is so important to me because of things in my past. But I looked at all of the equations and said that means empowering him. That means teaching him discriminatively what do I say yes to and what do I say no to. And I stick by that. Um, that's super important to me. It's hard. It is hard. And you got to walk that line and constantly be going back and forth and going, that's too much. This is too little. Be on the job. You can do it. I did. You can do it. Okay. Um, so loving you all. All right. Uh, all right. We're going to be back tomorrow. Tomorrow. So my big reinforcer is that tomorrow I get to be with Moira Giamatteo from Taka. And boy, they've got some big announcements from Taka that are coming for us. And uh, we get to do Let's Talk movies where we just go through everything that we've been watching this last month. And yes, we are both ponies, parents of neurodiverse individuals. And so we are, we're going to come from that point, but it isn't a show exclusively about autism. But every month we try to review something that has a little bit of an impact to the autism community. This month we are reviewing the season three of Lock and Key, which uh, one of the principal cast this season is our very own Kobe Bird, who has done red carpets for us for Autism Live. So we're going to be reviewing that. Spoiler alert, I love it. Love him, right? Uh, but also I'm going to be reviewing for the first time, not even in my written reviews have I said anything, but uh, Extraordinary Attorney Wu, which is all about autism. Uh, it's, it's a Korean, a K-drama, where the lead character is a young woman on the spectrum who is a lawyer. So don't miss that. I have things to say tomorrow. I, it should be fun. All right, you guys, much love to all of you. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow with Let's Talk Movies. Until then, give your kiddos a hug from me if it's appropriate, right? Uh, and one for you if it's appropriate. Until then, bye-bye. If you found anything helpful in this video, please give us a like. In fact, make sure that you smash that subscribe button on YouTube and give us a like on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Instagram for important updates. And please download our free podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you so much. See you next time.